All right, we're going to continue our Pioneers of the Faith series. Last week we looked at Evan Roberts on the Welsh Revival. And if you remember, the Welsh, and there's a reason I'm putting this on the board, the Welsh Revival that we looked at last week started about 1904 to 1906 or so. Uh, two and a half years it lasted under Evan Roberts. Tonight, the reason why I'm doing these revivals, and um, we'll just put Evan Roberts there so you know who that is. Um, so tonight we're going to look at a guy named um, Seymour, William Seymour. And it's the Azusa Street. And the reason why I'm putting these two together and because it's going to span from 1906 to probably close to 110, a little over. It lasts three and a half years. Isn't that interesting? That's not really <coughs> right on these revivals. Now, there's a lot of revivals prior to that and the revivals after, but these are the ones that are really well known and impacted. Um, well, the Welsh revival impacted not only Wales, but um, a lot of Europe and, and around the world, and it reached into Azusa Street, which is in Los Angeles. So, um, but the Azusa Street Revival, it really, they said um, hundreds and millions of people, even afterwards, like the Assemblies of God came from that, Four Square came from that, Full Gospel Bismen, um, the um, <coughs> All kinds of people, if you do a study on it, um, the whole charismatic and Pentecostal movement um, sprang from the Azusa Street Revival. So it, according to a lot of people, it had more far-reaching results than the Welsh Revival did. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. You can see the, the overlap. Now, if you remember, um, I told you last week that there was a man named Frank Bartleman who assisted William Seymour, and he was writing to Evan Roberts when they were trying to get something started here, and he said, pray for California, pray for Los Angeles. And so um, Evan Roberts was corresponding with Frank Bartleman, and um, any, any white guy that's not the black guy, so pick There's three pick, of them. Yeah, well, I'll Four tell you which one it is, which Five. one's Frank Bartleman. Nope. It'll be a single picture. I don't get him an order here because I have no clue what how they're going to come out. But um, is that the no? no. That's, that looks like a black guy. Right? <laughs> um, that's Frank Bartleman right there. So this guy here got to Los him. Angeles before before um, Seymour did. He did a lot of the groundwork, a lot, a lot of praying, a lot of so forth and so on. And we'll we'll come back to him. So if you want to put Seymour back up there, but. Um, so anyway, I just want you to see that these two are overlapping, where this one begins to end, this one's starting to pick up, okay, just so you know that, so you get a timeline going there. So William Seymour serving, and I'm going to stick to my notes here because I want to, I want to really give you the, 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 paint the picture of this. This is a really interesting revival. So William Seymour serving as a catalyst of the Pentecostal movement. He turned a tiny Los Angeles horse stable on Azusa Street into an international center of revival. Now, during this time, there was segregation, Jim Crow laws, all of that that was going on. But in Los Angeles, they had Hispanics, they had uh, blacks, they had Asians, they had Chinese, they had Russians. There was all kinds of nationalities at this time living <coughs> in Los Angeles. And so there was not a segregation. There was no, you know, racism's everywhere. But they were worshiping together, whereas other parts of the country, they all had their own churches and restaurants and bathrooms, and you know the drill on that. So some of the stories that came out of this revival, um, these people believed, trusted God, and God moved on their behalf. For instance, um, a lot of farming was there, and sometimes the insects would start um, destroying the fields, the crops, and they would actually go out as a prayer team, and they would start speaking to these insects that, you know, you stay out of these and would make them, they would walk these boundaries and these crops would be saved. You're going to hear, there's all kinds of stories 
And, um, and I'm not doing an exposition on this because it, it would be, I mean, there's several books and documentaries and stuff that um, I'm just giving you what overlaps in all of them, meaning that I'm going to give you stories that are not controversial because some stuff you don't know. And I don't want to say this happened when it may not have. So I'm just going to highlight what most biographers agree and got their all information. That's what I did last week with the um, Welsh Revival. Now, at one time, firemen came rushing into the building where they were meeting to put a fire out, and there was no fire when they got in there. And because the neighbors were calling, hey, the building's on fire, they get there, there's no fire. And all they can think of was what they were seeing was the glory of God that was resting on that building. So you're going to get all kinds of stories like that. Now, let's start with um, William Seymour. He was born in Centerville, Louisiana, a few miles from the Gulf of Mexico, in May of 1870 and they had just been freed from Civil War had just happened they uh, they just been uh, set free from slavery a few years years earlier from his birth but Seymour was raised in a world of horrible racial racial violence because it just because Lincoln set them free it didn't mean they actually got free or that there was no racism or anything like that the Ku Klux Klan was big at the time like I said Jim Crow laws was happening that had been established and um, so this was the kind of culture and tension that he was raised in. Though his family had been freed from slavery, um, they continued working on the plantation. And um, as they, you know, not being set, free, being set free, they still worked on the plantation. However, Seymour found his identity in Jesus Christ, not in skin color or anything like that, or what, what the culture or what the, 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 the people and the, and the way that it was during his time. He, he got his identity in Jesus Christ, believing the Lord was his only, the only liberator of mankind. Now, he was a sensitive young boy, um, hungry for God, for truth, and had experiences, had, had visions that made him want to go be evangelistic. He believed that the Lord would return at any time, as a lot of them did during that period of time. Um, at the age of 25, he left the home lands of southern Louisiana and headed to Indianapolis, Indiana. Now according to the U.S. Census of 1900, only 10 percent of the black race had ever left the South. But Seymour was determined, so he left and he was um, a determined man and that he would never ever be shackled down by his, the previous generations. So the North was thriving as he went up there and offered, uh, North was offering many opportunities but, and businesses were still close to black, the black population. So all he could find at that point as work was a um, waiter in a hotel. But not long after he arrived, he joined the uh, Simpson Chapel Methodist Episcopal Church. And this branch of Methodist had a strong evangelist, evangelistic outreach to all classes of people and it appealed to him and so that's where he joined rank with them. Racial tension was getting worse in that area so he moves from Indianapolis, Indiana to Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, being an adamant follower of John Wesley who believed in salvation as a work of the Spirit, uh, believed that sanctification was a second work of the Spirit, then there was a theology that the Holy Spirit is a third work um, of grace or whatever. So there's all kinds of theology going around about um, salvation and baptism and sanctification and the Holy Spirit and so forth and so on. So anyway, in his search for church, he stumbled upon the Evening Light Saints, which would later become known as the Church of God Reformation Movement. Now, this group did not worship with music. They were very legalistic. They didn't wear any rings, makeup. They didn't go to dances. They didn't play cards. They were just very strict legalistic branch of, of church. However, the um, group was extremely happy They uh, and they found joy and faith in their difficult times and Seymour was warmly welcomed there so he hung out there for a time. Now during this time in which he was called he contacted, now you'll see pictures of him, you know, he start just going through some of those pictures, um, where he contacted uh, smallpox and left his um, one of his eyes blind and his face was well scarred so he wore a beard, you know, had a beard most of the time to cover up his scars. Um, but again, he pulled through that and he went on to um, Texas to fulfill his calling. So he leaves Cincinnati, Ohio and goes to Texas. Now as he gets to Houston, he finds family there and sets up. In the summer of 1905, evangelist Charles Parham, which we're going to look at him too, 
uh, maybe next week. Evangelist Charles Parham was holding crusades. Now you can get a picture of him. Not, don't go into these pictures yet. Just, just pictures of the black guy. There's right only, there. There's only one black guy. Now go to go to a white guy. <laughs> there's no way these slides. I'm gonna have to. We have to call her. Right Frank there. Beans. No, that's Frank Barlin. There's another one. We already talked about Frank. These We're going to Charles. So up to date. At the bottom. Just go through them, and we'll just. We'll, I'll tell you when to stop. You don't have numbers for them. That's why. Keep on. Yeah. Keep on. That's his wife. When I talk about his wife, you go to that slide. <laughs> <laughs> There's none up there. That's all you have. Okay. House. Anyway, Charles Parham um, <laughs> was in Topeka, Kansas. He had a Bible college there. Well, he had to move it to Houston. And so by the time that Seymour gets to Houston, Charles Parham is down there and he's doing ministry and he's going to start up a, a, um, a Bible college. So Seymour is down there and he's ministering in, ch in churches. He's doing some things. And uh, he ends up filling in for a pastor at a church down there. Well, they find out that Charles Parham, who is called the father of Pentecost, by the way, and he's starting a Bible college. And they said, you know, you need to get down there and in, 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 in enroll. Well, you got the segregation laws. So um, he had to sit outside the... Um, classroom and they would open the window and he would sit outside or open the door and he'd be in the hallway because he was not allowed in the classroom because of the Jim Crow laws and everything that was going on at that time and so um, he, he went to Bible College now during this time at Bible College he was there for about a year or so and this is like 1905 close to 1906 there's a lady that has a Nazarene church in Los Angeles and so she um, contacts Charles Parham, and um, and so what happens at this point is that she says, "I'm looking for a pastor." Well, Charles Parham really liked um, William Seymour, and said, "You know, he had a hunger for God's word. He liked him, and said, hey, man, why don't you go?'" Well, he didn't have no money to get there, so all the students in the classroom raised money to get him a train ticket from Houston, Texas, to. Um, Los Angeles. So he's on his train ride there, and this is how he gets to Los Angeles in 1906. It's closing in on 1906. I, I'm ballparking these figures, but we're, we're close. And um, so he gets there. And the thing is, when he gets there, he gets his first sermon. She says, oh, they're all happy. He gets there. He does his first sermon in Los Angeles. The people are hungry there. Now remember, during this time, Frank Bartleman that we saw a picture of um, he's passing out tracts he's witnessing he's praying all these revivals what they have in common is a lot of prayer they're all praying and they're believing and they're trusting God for a move all of them have the same they're they're believing God for revival because remember the revival was already taking place in the in, in Wales so they're all believing so in 1906 lot in Los Angeles um, there's a Nazarene church he goes to that they want him to, to um, pastor. And he believes in the Holy Spirit. He believes, though he hasn't had the experience of speaking in tongues, but he does believe in the Holy Spirit. And, um, but when he gets there, he preaches on Acts chapter 2, where it talks about how the Holy Spirit came on the disciples and they came out speaking in tongues. And, um, and a lot of people didn't like that. Some did, some didn't. So he goes out to lunch. Now this is his first sermon. He comes back and the door's padlocked. And there's a note, we don't want you anymore. Uh -huh. So now he's got a little bit of money, because remember they gave him money to get out there. So he's got just a little bit of money and nowhere to sleep. And so he's just talking about a gut punch. But there were some people in that meeting and their last names were Lees. Um, L-E-E, -E, and um, they said, well, why don't you just come to our house? And he was so distraught, he hid himself in the, in, the, in the bedroom and wouldn't come out. He just prayed and prayed and prayed. And um, so anyway, um, this family was very kind to him, and he was there for several days, and he didn't leave his room. Like I said, he just was praying and waiting on the Lord for what, what's next. So um, out of that home, while he's there, the, the husband starts praying with him then the wives and some friends and family and this little this little um, house and you can find that right there that house right there he got it he got one 
is um, is where this prayer meeting started. And um, so anyway, I'm I'm just trying to give you a picture of this. So this really starts with a with a handful, and you may not know this, but the Zoo Street Revival starts with a black man leading with a few black people. So it really had its roots in just a small, and, and what was nice, and again, <clears throat> what they preached was there's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no male, there's no female, there's no white, there's no black, and what happened was they, a lot of white people started coming because uh, <clears throat> there was no room in the house, so people was on the porch, people were down the steps, people, now I have a character of, um, or a, or somebody drew something. But anyway, people started being on the side of the house. They'd open up the windows so they could hear people praying inside. They were behind the house. They were in the street. They were on the sidewalks. And something was starting to take place with this little prayer group that just took off in a matter of a week or two. It, 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 it definitely a breakthrough of some sort that was happening in that house and in that area. So the news spread quickly, bringing crowds that filled um, their backyard and surrounded their homes, like I said, and this was on Bonnie Bray Street. Bonnie Bray Street. That house is on Bonnie Bray Street. Some would stand outside the windows, like I said. So what happened was during this time, unusual healings were taking place. People were being healed of cancer, uh, being filled with the Spirit. And it was said that the front porch, there were so many people on that front porch that it collapsed. So they quickly got some people together and fixed the porch. Poor woman's porch, you know, collapses. Um, but that's how many people were coming to this thing. And But they fixed it and they got it working. And um, it was the third night of these meetings that William Seymour finally experienced and encountered the Holy Spirit where he um, spoke in tongues in April of 1906. And it becomes obvious that there had to be another meeting place. That house ain't going to be able to do it anymore. So you can get look for a white building. Okay? <laughs> A white building. <laughs> anyway, um, so they're looking for another place. So they find this place um, in an industrial business section in Los Angeles, um, Azusa Street, and it is dilapidated. It had been burnt, so there's still the, the walls were still singed from where it had caught on fire. Electrical wires and light bulbs are just hanging there. Um, wooden uh, or um, dirt floors. And they had an upstairs and a downstairs. Yeah, right there it is. And um, and he rented that for eight dollars a month. That's nice. But I don't know what. I mean, was that a lot of money? I'm sure that it was. So, but anyway, a local lumber company in Los Angeles donated lumber for the cause, and um, they placed sawdust on the floor and wooden planks. They nailed. Um, to barrels so that the, they would have empty pews and then he I, you had that crate where he his his pulpit was two crates one on top of the other and then you would, he would always have his head in that crate not to be seen because this was not being led by anybody nobody was a, the speaker every service was different they didn't know who was speaking um, spontaneous singing so forth and so on but that's a picture of, um, somebody drew of, of, of that. They don't actually have the picture. But it, it ends up being, they end up being the new tenants of 312 Azusa Street and um, had no clue that what was going to happen was going to turn into an international revival. So it was on April 12th that William Seymour had encountered the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. Um, the same year, is the, the same year he was baptized in the Holy Spirit, is when San Francisco had one of the worst earthquakes that ever happened and then like a few a day later they uh, Los Angeles got hit with some um, smaller ones from the San Francisco earthquake and so everybody th this earthquake I can't remember that the, if it, it, there's like 400,000 people in San Francisco 300,000 was displaced this is a horrible earthquake if you if you ever looked at it. It was one of the worst ones ever. So out of 400,000 people, I believe around 300,000 lost homes, businesses, uh, 10,000 died. Can you imagine 10,000 people died. And so people thought this was the end of the world. It's the judgment of God. Oh, and so it got the attention of people as 9-11. Remember how 9-11, everybody went to church that Sunday. Yeah. So you had that kind of... Um, Oh, what's what's happening? You know, again, 
their theology isn't 100% right, but they're who they are and doing what they're doing. And people were really taking God serious at this time, and they were hungry for God. So many people from all walks of life um, made their way, poor and rich, to, to, that, to that building. All right? So the meetings were spontaneous. I just lost my place. I just hit the wrong button here. Um, the meetings were spontaneous, so no one ever knew who was going to be the speaker. Um, all the music was impromptu, without the use of instruments or hymn books. The messages began with someone singing a song or giving a testimony. There was no programs. Someone would finally arise and bring forth an anointed message, but no one ever knew what it was. No one, you know, the speaker or the what, what message it was going to be. The speaker would be, of, now listen to this, the speaker, whoever it was, would be of any gender, and everyone felt that God was responsible for the altar calls, which would take place at an appointed time at, after the, during sometime of the meetings. The meetings were so anointed that if, that if anyone got up to speak and they were in the flesh, it was apparent, and they would sit down or someone would tell them, it, it ain't happening, sit down, you know, but in a nice way. Um, that kind of like took care of itself. Frank Bar Bartleman wrote, Many were curious and unbelieving, but others were hungry for God that would come to these meetings. Um, so outside persecution was inevitable. Um, people were coming there. All spiritualists was coming there. Hypnosis people were coming there to investigate and try to influence the meetings. So they had to, they had to be open to that kind of an attack from the outside. Then all the religious um, crazies... Um, the people who didn't believe in it, and crooks, <laughs> every walk of life that was evil came to this place to find out uh, how they can manipulate it or get something out of it. And so they, had, they just had to watch what was going on because as there was honest people there, there was a lot of dishonest people that would show up as well. Bartleman also wrote that he found early in the Azusa Street work that when um, anyone, and this is his own words, when anybody attempted to steady the ark, the Lord stopped working. So we dared not call the attention of the people too much to the work um, of the evil, lest they fear that, um, that if they spent too much time on this, that, or that. They just didn't want to, they just didn't want to manipulate or do anything that would harm what God. They wanted, basically wanted to be able to steward the presence of God and not um, get in the flesh and try to control what... Um, you remember, you remember what Evan Roberts says that we will only do what the Holy Spirit says to do. Well, they also had that mentality. So that's why they didn't have anything planned. Let the Holy Spirit show up and let him do his thing and we're not going to touch it. And um, So even with, when people would, would get in the flesh, it would have to re be really bad before they would correct it. I mean, it would have to be annoying to somebody to the right of you, to the left, you know, where all the attention is on you. Okay, that's when when you're bringing the attention on you, then everybody's watching you, and they're not engaging in the presence, and that's when they would bring some type of a correction. Um, but in spite of all this, Azuzu continued night and day. Now you got to stop there and say, are you are you open for a revival? Everybody is would say, oh yeah, I want a revival. I want a revival. People are praying for it. People are contending for it. Whatever words you want to use, they're trusting, believing, hoping. And yet, when it comes, it is a 24/7 deal. It, it's not. It's not. You can't just go back to business as usual. And like you say, two and a half years here, people's lives were completely. Remember, the businesses had to redo their timing. <clears throat> you know, um, sports teams couldn't play the sports on time because athletes wouldn't show up because they were going to the prayer meeting. So it's really going to affect culture. It's going to affect community and affect you individually. So, you know, these meetings went on night and day. And they were great. And um, so anyway, another said that, um, that they have to stop more than once as they're on their way to the, to the uh, check this out, on their way to the revival, they would have to stop more than once to pray to make sure they were right in their spirit because when they walked in there they didn't want to be in the flesh now again you may argue that regarding theology but this is not this is not about theology this is about what the spirit was doing in spite of bad theology i will prove it to you here in a minute 
So anyway, um, this is the kind of things people are like, man, they, they took this thing serious. And so one guy, he, he, he's, a, he, he's from Israel. He flies over, or whatever, in a ship, goes over there, and he gets into Los Angeles, and his whole point is to criticize the meeting for his own gain, whatever he was doing, and he was an Israelite. And he came over there, and so as they would be upstairs praying before the services started, the actual service, and there would be people praying. Well, this teenage girl was up there praying, and um, she got filled with the Holy Spirit, and as she was coming down the steps, she started speaking in tongues. Now, this is documented. This is not hearsay. She doesn't know what she's saying. And this Hebrew guy, Israelite guy, who come there to mock and get information to use against them and for his own gain, whatever he was up to, um, he, she's coming down the steps, and she is saying his first name. He's saying her last he, She's saying his first name. His last name, where he's, she's saying it in Hebrew as she's speaking in tongues. And he's hearing her say, this is who you are, your first name, last name, this is where you're from, and you came over here, and she, she spoke what his motive was. Man, he went to his knees, got up, grabbed her, went into the meeting and said, I came here to be an enemy. But I am just con I've just been converted. This woman has told me everything. It's in my heart. I came here for the wrong reasons. And he gave his life to the Lord. So, you know, and say that's correct. Well, that's what happened in the book of Acts. When they came out of the upper room, they were speaking in tongues. And people that were there from other countries, they were saying, how is these guys speaking my language? That's part of what was happening during um, in, in Acts. And it was happening here. So no service was going to be the same. You never know what the Spirit is going to do. If people were open and hungry and with no motive, with no, no attention on yourself, you're there. Last thing you want is you to be the center of any type of attention because the Holy Spirit is the attention. And, and, and He would move in, in, in ways like that. It was also said that the power of God would be felt in Azusa, even in Azusa, even outside the building. Scores of people were seen dropping on their on, dropping in the streets before they even reached the mission. By summer, crowds had reached staggering numbers, often into the thousands. The scene to become an international gathering. Train stations unloaded people, buttloads of people, visitors who came from all over the continent. News accounts of the meeting spread over the nation in both the secular and religious press. Many that had encountered this revival would feel a call to go to other countries. And so people from that, from that revival became missionaries to Scandinavia, China, India, Egypt, Ireland, and various other nations. One, which I'm going to mention this, is because we're going to check this woman out in the, in the weeks to come. A guy named Owen Adams of California traveled to Canada from Azusa where he met Robert Simple. This would be Amy, Simple, um, as her, Amy Simple's husband. You'll know, you know her by Amy Simple McPherson. And so um, they wanted to come, but they were going to China or somewhere. Well, he dies early, prematurely. She comes back because she's, she's all about this revival. And she marries another guy. His name's McPherson. He's, he's in on it. And so we're going to get into her because, again, let me tell you, let me just give you some names here. You go to all those guys, too, by the way, the picture of all the guys. Yeah. So you got F.F. F. Bosworth. He wrote, um, he wrote the book, The Healer, which is a good book. Um, John G. Lake, we're going to talk about John G. Lake. Um, I, don't, I think I know who he is, but I'm not sure they don't have a name on that. But here are some names. Um, uh, Dowie, that's his last name, Alexander Dowie from Chicago, the city of Zion. Um, you're going to have Charles Parham, which we've already talked about. You're going to have Amy Simple McPherson. Okay. Um, there's other names I'll, I'll throw in there as they come that were also revivalists during that time, doing great, especially Dowie and, uh, oh, the other one was John G. Lake, which you see a picture of him there. Um, <coughs> Dowie and Lake <coughs> corresponded a lot, and they had, wait till we get to these guys, the, the healings are phenomenal. The raising the dead. He has more, do John G. Lake, this guy right here, is going to have more documented healings than probably <coughs> Um, Dowie 
His whole church had wheelchairs and crutches all over the wall where people walked out completely here. Paralytics, people in wheelchairs. And they would every time somebody got here, they'd put the crutches. So hopefully I'll have pictures of that um, when we get to him. I just want you to see that God was moving during this time. And there were a lot of players that God was using. So it's not just one guy, one little meeting. This thing was breaking open wide open. So John G. Lake visited the Azusa Street Revival, so that's probably when he visited there. Now listen to what he says. In his book, he would later write of Seymour, and this is what he said. He had the funniest vocabulary, but I want to tell you, now he was a doctor, so he's an educated guy, this John G. Lake, before he went into the ministry. He says he had a, he, talking about Seymour here, he says he had a funny vocabulary, but I want to tell you there were doctors, lawyers, and professionals coming to sit at this man's feet to listen to the marvelous things coming from his lips. It was not what he said in words. It was what he said from his spirit to my heart that showed me he had more of God in his life than any man I had ever met up to that time. It was God in him that attracted the people. There would be people that would, other churches would come to try to fix his theology because this speaking in tongues thing, as it is to people today, no, nah, that's crazy, that's wrong. And so people were coming, theologians were coming, making their way to him, and they would, the presence of God would be so strong on him, and he'd be so humble, polite, and kind, that they would feel guilty for even bringing up the reason why they're there. And the guy even said, some of the documentaries I was watching this week, the guy even said, we, we just had to stop. We, we, it wasn't that he was right, we were wrong, but our, our spirit was wrong. And he just out-loved us. He, just, he was more humble than us, more kind to us. He just sat there and smiled while we were coming to him with theology, you know, how he was wrong. But anyway, missionaries were called from that mission uh, from, to nations, as we said. Now, the members of Azuzu carried tiny bottles of oil wherever they went. They would knock on doors to witness and pray for the sick throughout Los Angeles. They, st they, um, they would stand on the street corner singing and preaching and working as volunteers, um, soup kitchens, whatever. It was just an incredible time. People were taking it to the streets, in other words. Persecution outside of Azuzu was expected, but it finally... Now, here's where we're going get to in, get into this. It finally began within. Not, it's not coming from without so much now that it's now coming from within. And um, so members arrived all, let's see, finally began from within. Early one autumn morning, some members arrived at the mission to see the words Apostolic Faith Mission written across the top of the building. And they started accusing the mission, Seymour, of evolving into just another denomination. Now this is where I read the book by Frank Bartleman, which is all about the Azusa Street Revival probably read it two or three times over the years. But he said when he came there and saw that sign, he was one of them that got upset because he was adamant, you can't control this. Don't name it. Don't organize it. Don't do anything. Keep it going the way that it did. Now the reason why he puts that sign up there is because that's the name of the, the ministry of Charles Parham that he went to school in Houston, Texas, and he saw him as like a, a father, you know, spiritual father. And so, you know, he wanted to put that up there. And, the, and, it, and it definitely, Frank Bartleman says in his book, it definitely made a difference in how the spirit moved. But they were really against it because they didn't want to organize it. They were all about it staying an organism, not making it into just another organization or a denomination. Um, so anyway... From that time, the trouble began and division started, and um, it was no longer a free spirit for all as it had been. The, um, so this is one of the big things. So the church ends up, the, or the mission, the, the movement, gets hit a little bit from that, but they, they recover. So the new body of believers also had a misconception of the concept of tarrying. This is another division. They would simply wait for hours for the spirit to come with restlessness, and, um, and they felt many were abusing this time. Um, rather than just trusting that the Spirit was there, there was something about this tearing, this, a, 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 a teaching, a, a new doctrine of tearing of some sort or whatever. But again, 
I'm just telling you this because this is the kind of stuff that happens not only in revival meetings, it happens in church. <clears throat> so on top of all that, there was also misconceptions of what speaking in tongues were and why it was needed. Different manifestations caused division, which was, um, you know, some of these, were, these divisions um, or concerns was legit. And um, so what he ended up doing, because things started getting, you know, I guess a division, and things were being questioned. So he asked for Charles Parham from Houston to come and, you know, help us get through some of this, this bumpy, you know, road that we're on right now to kind of so, because we don't want to ruin what God's doing. We, we, want, to, we want to store this thing. So um, William Seymour looked at Charles Parham as a father, and um, he didn't agree completely with all this theology, but he looked to him enough to trust him to come and try to make sense out of all of this. So, um, when he gets there, Parm doesn't like what he sees. He's like, this is out of control. There's too much flesh going on here. Well, they were trying to, to, to do it, to control things, but he didn't like what he was seeing. And so, he preached a few nights, and um, he leaves to go have lunch or dinner. He comes back, and the, play, and the door's padlocked. It's funny because what that woman did to Seymour, on, remember this first sermon? He goes to get something to eat, comes back, and he's padlocked. Well, he does the same thing to Charles Parham. Now, this is the guy he goes to his Bible college. He trusts him. He brings him in, doesn't like what he's saying, doesn't take advice from him, hates his advice, hates his exhortation, hates his message, and says, um, when he leaves, we'll padlock the door. <laughs> and that's what they did. And um, so what happens is... Charles Parham takes the, his, his, the, the, his, takes the ministry, what he came there to do, to another place in Los Angeles, gets another building, and takes half of the people with him. Because again, this guy's popular, he's the, you know, considered the father of Pentecost, so another split happens. And, um, but the spirit stays where um, Seymour's at in Azusa. Spirit, still, spirit's still moving, but Charles Parham takes half of the people to another building, and the Spirit falls there. Signs and wonders are happening at both places. Now, um, what do you do with that? So there's a difference of opinion on style, on what's flesh, what's spirit, but the Spirit doesn't get quenched. It honors where Seymour's at. It honors where Parham's at. And the, and the ministry, can, both ministries continue, and the Spirit falls. Um, so, William Seymour believed that each person should allow their own emotional experience based on how each individual understood the moving of the Spirit, whether it was right or wrong. Seymour's theology was to allow the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wanted, but only a few knew enough about the moving of the Spirit to lead the people <clears throat> in at Seymour. At the, at the place. Seymour felt that if the culture was forced into a certain mode of expression, then the Holy Spirit would not manifest himself. So Charles Parham went on his way and did what he did. Now, I would submit that most revivals get like this, as churches do, and experience this kind of division because people want to study the ark. There's always something that ends up happening, whether it's just a regular church or a Revival of some sort, something always ends up happening that offends somebody. That somebody doesn't like what he does or what she does, and they take personal offense at that. Now, you have to understand something about offenses, because you're going to find out every time... This stuff gets ugly because people get offended. Now, now they, we're talking about revival meetings, but it's anywhere. So what happens, you've got to ask the Lord. If you're looking at a revival, you've got to ask the Lord, is it about me? Or is it about the Holy Spirit? Is it about Jesus being magnified? Or did I get my feelings hurt? Or, you know, I don't like the way he exhorted me because this is the way that it came out with. This is going to happen again. The padlock's going to come out another time. Okay? <laughs> so I, this, this is probably one of the ugliest, saddest ones. Although, Evan Roberts didn't end good. You remember how he ended, right? This one doesn't end good either, guys. You know why? Because people can't make it about Jesus. they got to make it about themselves. And this is one of the things I'm going to tell you. 
If you've got a spirit of offense, it will come out. You will get offended. You'll get your feelings hurt. Something will happen. Because when the glory of God shows up, it exposes the flesh of all kinds of people. And we've just got to realize, hey, we're who we are and we're laying down this stuff because it's not about us. And God does this. He tests to see. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows our motives. And I guarantee you, He's going after the things that offend us by offending us. Because truth always offends. Or if somebody, Jesus said, offenses must come. They're going to come. Right? So you've got to know how to handle them. Offense is scandalon in the Greek. It means the, tri the, the, the uh, trigger. You, you grab that. You're, it's bait, man. Um, John Bevere did a book on, uh, in the early 90s called The Bait of Satan. It's all on offense. And, and, and it's just these revivals all get blown up and division happens because of offense. And Jesus had offense all the time in his ministry. He was offending people all the time, not on purpose, but just being who he was, doing what the Father said. And I can show you stories, but by the book, on, by John Bevere, it's old, it's like I said, in the 90s. But anyway, um, the padlock's going to come out again. Um, so I just find it interesting about the padlock deal, because what was done to him, padlock, he'll do it to others. Now, William Seymour was married in 1908. Now, watch this. A lot of, lot of single ladies was in that prayer meeting, and one particular that um, was in charge of the publication, the, I can't think of the, the name of the magazine, um, and the mailing list, and money, and all that. Well, Charles, you got the picture? Yeah. This woman here, before he got baptized in the Spirit, before they were married, I don't know if they even liked each other, but she was coming to the prayer meetings. She's sitting on a stool. The power of God hits her, knocks her off the stool, and she starts manifesting the Spirit in, in, in tongues and so forth and so on. They end up getting married. So in 1908, they get married. And, um, which, is, which should be a glorious thing, right? But no, people in that day thought Jesus was coming any time. So a lot of the ladies mostly the ladies, got mad because they thought he shouldn't be wasting his time on getting married when the Lord's going to be coming. We need to be about the work of the Lord, not going out and getting married and starting families. Well, this particular woman, I can't remember her name, but she worked really close with him, and like I said, she was in charge of the publication that was going out, um, the, the mail coming in, mail going out, uh, money coming in, um, so forth and so on. She just says, I'm out of here. Well, many believe that she was just, she was in, she secretly in love with him, and therefore just got offended that he got married. He was jealous, and put, she took the mailing list. And they said, "What's what's wrong with that?" Do you remember in the '80s? Have you ever heard on TV or whatever that someone stole my mailing list? Because this is before computers. Mailing list is money. Okay. And you don't want no one to know your mailing list. Some, some preachers will exchange. If they were good buddies, they would exchange mailing lists. This is the stuff that went on that's called ministry, right or wrong, because addresses is money. Because you start sending that. Well, in this case, this was a wrong thing. She moves up to Portland, Oregon, and starts or, or, or joins a person who came from Azuzu, and they start something, or she joins something that's already started but came from Azusa. And they thought maybe she might come back. Well, she didn't come back. So what she did was she public, she made, she put the magazine out. It went to 50,000 people around the world, and it, national and international. And no one knew that there was a division. It looked like that everything was still the same. She changed the address to Portland, Oregon. So now all correspondence, all ties, all offerings, everything now goes to Port. Because how is he going to tell his the people that are giving and, and corresponding that that we didn't move to Portland. So everything goes to Portland now. And so he goes up there to confront her, drives up to Portland, Oregon from, San, from Los Angeles and confronts her. And it doesn't go well, but it doesn't work. He, this, this was a blow to, uh, to, to, the, to his ministry, to the, to the Azusa Street Revival, because funds weren't coming in. People weren't coming there. They weren't, they weren't making their way there because what? You moved. Right. We're going to go up there. There, you know what? Do you remember in the 70s you had three TV stations? Well, there is no TV stations. 
You don't know what's going on unless it's through the mail. So this is huge. And it was a major blow just because he got married. And one person did it. Now, that's wrong. That's not even debatable. But I'm just trying to show you, in these revivals, people get ugly. They get ugly in church. Well, you don't have to have a revival, and people get ugly. But especially revivals, because it, the Spirit of God goes after. You know, it's a purging that takes place. When the glory of God shows up, um, you're going to feel it. I mean, can you imagine if, if I can look at these lights, but if I look at the sun, that's a, that's a greater degree of light. The closer you get to God, the more you come undone. That's why certain revelations affect you differently. Some you're like, ooh, that was good. Some, ooh, that, was, that gave me goosebumps. Others like, I'm undone, man. I'm undone. What's happening? You're, there's aspects of getting close to God and how he's dealing with you. Does that make sense? Yeah. So when a revival takes place, that's why things can get ugly. Because it's exposing our motives. It's exposing, well, that's why there's a lot of flesh <coughs> in revivals. Um, so when you're asking for a revival, it's, it's, it's not just jumping up and down for joy. Um, you know, things can get bad. So this crippled Seymour's worldwide publication outreach. Um, his entire national, international list of over 50,000 names left um, have been stolen, leaving him with only the Los Angeles list. And then in May of 1908, the Apostolic Faith was uh, sent out with the cover, which I went, oh, oh, I'm not going to repeat that. Um, by the next month, no articles of Seymour was in the publication. It never appeared again. And um, things just started going south then. Throughout 1909 and 1910, now we're going to be on the, the end of it. 1909, 1910, Seymour continued his ministry at the Azusa Street through the number of people, though the number of people decreased dramatically. Remember, there was thousands coming. It, it, it decreased drastically due to the lack of influence and funds. So he left two young men in charge at the mission, and he departed for Chicago on a cross-country preaching tour. And I'm sure he went to Dowie during that time because he's in Chicago, and there was some huge things going on there. So a man named William Durham held meetings at Azusa in his um, place, in, in um, Seymour's place. Dramatic preaching, um, hundreds flocked to, to these meetings, and it looked like Azusa was coming back to life with this guy while Seymour was away. Now, he did not believe, theologically, the way that... Seymour did. Let me tell you what Seymour says. Seymour says, if you come to me and you are not kind and you're mean and, um, you're, and, you, are not, and you are not showing that you have the Holy Spirit, um, I'm just going to judge you as not being saved. And if you do that while you're saved, you will have lost your salvation. Now understand something about... Um, Pentecostal holiness, because um, that came out of this. Um, a lot of legalism where your salvation didn't depend on works, but once you got saved, then you keep it by works. And any type of sin would make you lose your salvation. Um, and there's still people believe that today. That's fine. This William Durham. It starts taking off again. It looks like this is the second wave of Azuzu. It might not be ending. It might just be catching its breath and it's going to open up again. Well, William Durham believed in what they would call a finished work. And he was like, what? You can't lose your salvation because you sin. You'd be crazy. Well, half the, most of the church said, ah, ah. They call, they get a hold of um, Seymour and said what he's preaching and he makes a beeline back to Azusa and guess what's he guess what he does Padlock. he padlocks the door so <laughs> William Durham can't get in so again another split and so William Durham takes the people that liked that liked his message and the presence of the Lord and they went to another building and the spirit went with them but the spirit also stayed here now again what can you learn from that 
If somebody was wrong in their theology, why does the spirit stay? The spirit should go, I'm going where it's right theology. Right? So here's what I'm saying. When it comes to revival, you can't make it about anything but the Holy Spirit. Don't, you can't be a theologian. You can't say, oh, I've got a lot of people. This is the time to talk about the rapture. This time to talk about end times. This is the time to t teach on tithing. They didn't even take an offering. They just said, if you want to give, it's right back there. Give on your way out, whatever. Um, they, it just wasn't a typical church service. That It was a place where we're not doing what we do out there in other churches. This is a revival. This is where the Spirit shows up and does whatever He wants to do. But when man gets in there, then stuff happens. So they're, they're both, to me personally, I think they're both wrong because in that kind of a setting, theology, there, there is a group, uh, the Moravians, 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 um, in North Carolina years ago, they, they carried, the, uh, carried a revival. We'll talk about that one too. But they carried a revival and they had 24-7 worship and prayer. It was phenomenal and it went on for a long time, years. And, uh, but they had these three things, and I can't remember what they were, but one of them was love, because okay, love, they knew we got to keep, we got to, we got to steward this revival. Okay, we got to steward it. And so they knew that we love unconditionally. Second, it was um, love unconditionally, union. So we're because the prayer was that you be <clears throat> one, even as my father. And I are one. So union, which would be love, unconditionally, keeps you unified. The second one was liberty, meaning this. Let people believe whatever they want to believe. We're not going to make it about theology. If you remember about a year or so ago, I did that peripheral thing where I said, oh, there's all kinds of theology we could get into. But it's peripheral. You'll land somewhere. I said, but we've got to make it about Christology. It's got to be about Jesus. And you do what you want with your end times. You do what you want with this, that, and the other. But we're keeping it about, is that wrong? No. What does Paul say to the Corinthians? When I am among you, I determine on nothing but Christ and Him crucified, the finished work. That's all. I'm not, I don't care. Everything else is peripheral. Now, if you do that in revival, you just keep it about Jesus and let the Holy Spirit do. A.W. Tozer says, if you want the Holy Spirit to show up, just talk about Jesus. Because the Holy Spirit's job is to what? Unveil Jesus, to glorify Jesus. So he says, if you want a revival, you want to do it right, he says, just talk about Jesus and the Holy Spirit will always show up. So again, we get into this, but the Spirit goes this way and the Spirit goes that way because the Spirit's like, no, it is about Jesus. And there's still an aspect of these people making it about Jesus. That the Holy Spirit is, that's why the Spirit's still there. They're making it about Jesus, but they get caught up in their doctrines. They're making it about Jesus, but they get caught up in um, jealousies and offenses. And, um, but one thing is, you know, again, they were really <clears throat> serious about not touching that ark. The last conflict at Azusa took place between Seymour and Durham. That was the last one. And that shook, that, that really... He never ever um, bounced back from rebound from, from that with Durham. But Durham would go on to say, I got nothing against the guy. He's one of the most powerful men I've ever met. Um, he said nothing but nice things about him. But it was just it was theological differences. Um, but anyway, so um, let me go on here. So in 1921. <coughs> William Seymour made his last ministry campaign across America where he returned to Los Angeles in 22. People began to notice that he looked very weary. He attended many ministry conventions but was never publicly recognized from the platform. <clears throat> Which doesn't make any sense. But So in 1922, while at the mission, Seymour suffered a sudden attack of severe pain in his chest. One of the workers ran for the doctor. Upon examination, he was told, man, you need to rest. And um, about five o'clock later that evening, um, the same afternoon, while dictating a letter, another chest pain clinched him and he died. Died of a heart attack at the age of 52. So his ending wasn't good at all because again, with that last, that last hit, but he tried to bounce back and he would go to meetings. And it was like, 
this man who was the center of the one of the biggest revivals in the, the biggest revivals in America is a jealousy that no one would say come up here man now, hey we got so we got William Seymour come up here and you know open up in prayer they ignored him when he died there was less than 200 people at his funeral and his tombstone said our pastor so um, what's the difference between Paul says Paul's getting ready to get his head chopped off and Timothy says, all have forsaken me. Where's everybody at? It's just, what, what happens? Offenses. We're, we're, we, we say we love God, we say we love one another, but we may, it's really about us. Everybody, everything has to go our way or, nah, we're done. Mm -hmm. So you see these revivals and you see how it brings out the ugly, but it also brings out the good in people where people are getting healed they're laying hands and we don't want we don't want to touch this ark offenses can touch the ark you know you can stop you can you, you can stop a, a good thing by being ugly you know and so we want to really just pause in our lives especially because we're going to learn a lot this is the thing about uh, the series is we're going to look at the good the bad and the ugly what can we learn because to be able to steward a revival is honorable. I mean, do you, when was the last time, was you ever in one? And if God would show up and bring us one, don't you think you want to be ready for it? You don't want to be unaware of it. You don't want to be not ready. You, you want to blow it up. You want to get ugly and blow it up? Because you can. It's happened. Or do you want to learn? And I, I feel in my spirit that this is the time to, to go through these meeting, these revivals and these men, learn what they did good, learn what they did wrong so we don't make the same mistakes they make because I, I'm not doing this thing so my ending's bad. I'm hoping and believing that God's going to pour out uh, uh, His Spirit in ways that's just going to create, create a, a, a huge harvest that we can't even imagine. I mean, there's a lot of hope there um, I don't think that we're going to go with our tail between our legs. I'm, I'm not looking for a rapture. I'm looking for a glorious church that's going to occupy, you know, and it's going to um, heal the sick and raise the dead. I'm looking for a church that's going to do what Jesus did. If he's in us, why is he not doing what he did when he was among us? All right? All right, so anyway, she, his wife, picks up the baton, but it really doesn't go nowhere. It just, you know, um, she struggles. People are coming in there trying to take it over because she's a woman, and she does the best she could. But eventually, um, they get into court over battles of whose building it is now that he's dead, who's going to take over the meeting. And the, just to cut, to make a long story short, the judicial system, the court, said, you know what, it's been days and weeks and months this thing's just been sitting here. And they got tired of it, and they just said, you know what, Go check on that building. And they just said, you know what? They condemned it. That'll end this whole thing. And so it went to the city, and the city tore it down and put a parking lot. So you can't even go to 312 Azusa Street and see any memorial, anything there. It, it's like it never was there, and it never happened. Okay. You know, and, um, and again, you know, it's, that's, just, that's just life. And this is the things we've got to learn about are we going to learn something from this or are we prone to make the same mistakes that they made and um, but anyway the thing I want to leave you with is that the Holy Spirit is the is is just both of these revivals the, the, the takeaway for me with both of these revivals that are the same is that it was all about the Holy Spirit so what does Jesus say to his disciples Terry in Jerusalem and wait what wait for who the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Yep. because the Father you may not you may not see this but the Father God or just God in the Old Testament shows up and tries his best to talk to Israel and he sends prophets so it was the Father, God, working with Israel in the Old Testament. And you know what? They don't listen. So Jesus comes. <clears throat> Jesus the Son. 
comes in the Gospels for what, three and a half years? Well, ministry. Three and a half years, and they crucify him. So God sends the prophets, they kill him. God is the only one talking to Israel. They only know him as Yahweh. They only see him as God is one. They don't have the, uh, uh, re the revelation of Trinity yet. They'll get that when Jesus comes. And so during the Old Testament, God sends Israel prophets and they kill him. Jesus, so God says, in the Gospels, they crucify him. They got one shot left of the Trinity in the epistles to today. This is it, and it's the Holy Spirit. That's what I believe blaspheming the Holy Spirit is, is I, I came and you rejected me. I sent my son, you rejected me. And if you reject the promptings of the Holy Spirit, I got nothing left. <laughs> There's no fourth member of the Trinity. So everything has to be about the Holy Spirit because the, the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit proceeds, the Nicene Creed, proceeds from the Father and the Son. We have the Holy Spirit, and that's why everything is about the Holy Spirit. Who unveils Jesus? Who unveils the Father? It's the three in one. That's why we have to be Trinitarian as well as Christo Christological and definitely grace-oriented, un uh, unconditional love. All right? So you keep that as the main thing, you'll store it any type of revival for yourself or for a church or a community, a gathering of some sort. It's all about the Holy Spirit. I love what Tozer says. You want the Holy Spirit to show up? Talk about Jesus. Questions or comments? And again, I didn't cover everything. I, it's, it's, it's a lot. There's a lot. You mentioned somebody covering your life in an hour? <laughs> I have something funny. Now what that last part what you just said there's uh, not four in the Godhead Robbie and I were in the kitchen this afternoon we were cleaning the dishes and that and we were singing different songs and stuff and we got to one um, that had the, the Trinity in it mm -hmm. and Rob was uh, saying the father uh, something about three and I almost said four <coughs> And, and then I looked at Rob and said, wait a minute, there ain't no four in the Godhead. <laughs> yeah, I just thought of that when you said that. It was fun. <laughs> yep, yep. Good stuff. Father, we bless you. We thank you. Lord, we want to be able to navigate through, through a move. And your sovereign moves where you sovereignly move among us. And we also want to be able to steward our own revival that can happen today if we would just have our eyes open to, to the Spirit is here. The Spirit is now. God, we're, we're waiting on God. This is the tearing. We're waiting on God. And He's like, no, nah, it's the finished work. I'm waiting on you. And so, Lord, show us. Show us, Lord. Open our eyes that these encounters with you, these intimate encounters with you, we can have our own personal revival all the time. All the time. Because Jesus said, out of our belly shall what? Flow. Flow. Not, not leak. Flow. Not stop and go. But flow. Flow. Rivers of living water. Out of the temple. In, the, in, in Ezekiel. Out of the temple, which we are the temple. That water goes to the knee, or to the ankle, to the knee, to the waist, to where we're swimming in it. It's, unba it's, 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 it's unlimited. Unlimited. Paul will go on to say he's able to do above and beyond what we can ask or think. We haven't even scratched the surface of, of encountering God in a supernatural way. Lord, it could be simply unbelief. I don't know. I don't know. But open our eyes to see what, what is in us, what we have, what as containers we contain. The whole Godhead. The kingdom of God. Revival is in us. It's right now bubbling, bubbling, being stirred right now. We just don't perceive it. We don't perceive it. And we can let this, we can let these rivers out once our eyes are open to it. We can let it out and we can see encounters. We can see all kinds of things. We can see the ministry of Jesus finally get manifested again and turn our world 
our known world upside down. Our church, our community, our family. Do you realize you can have your life turned upside down at any time? And then your church? And then a community? Lord, teach us through these series. We're going to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of all these, these ministries, these men and women. But Lord, you honored their faith because you put it's your faith in them. You honored them in spite of themselves. And they did the best that they could in stewarding the ark. But they did make mistakes. And they did good things. And we want to learn from them. Amen.